Hi, and welcome to Radonc Talks, a lecture series designed for students and residents of radiation oncology. My name is Rhea. I'm currently a PGY4 resident at the University of Pittsburgh. And in today's talk, we will be discussing the management of ductal carcinoma in situ. If you've been following along with the breast cancer series, you might have seen our early stage breast cancer and locally advanced breast cancer lectures. And uh, we're just gonna be discussing the same, uh, in the same type of uh, structure, the evidence for why we do what we do when it comes to DCIS. In our very first uh, breast cancer overview lecture, we talked about DCIS and uh, mentioned uh, some of its features. So I just wanted to recap what we do know about DCIS. So around 20% of all breast cancers are actually DCIS. And of the cancers that are in situ, around 80% are DCIS and only 20% are something called LCIS, which is lobular carcinoma in situ. DCIS without treatment will progress to invasive malignancy um, around 30% of the time over 30 years. So it's, it's a slow growing tumor, but it can progress to invasive malignancy. LCIS on the other hand is not considered a malignancy um, unless it's a subtype called pleomorphic LCIS, in which case we treat like high-grade DCIS. So that's an important distinction to realize is that DCIS is considered kind of a precancer lesion, but LCIS is not considered a malignancy. If untreated, 80% or 30% of the time, DCIS will progress to invasive malignancy over 30 years, and that's why we treat it. Most DCIS cases, around 80% of them, are going to be hormone positive, and DCIS is typically diagnosed on a screening mammogram followed by a diagnostic mammogram. And the most common finding that we see is actually something called microcalcifications. Linear branching calcifications have a higher likelihood of being high-grade DCIS, whereas fine granular calcifications tend to be more low-grade. And in terms of staging, DCIS is considered a stage zero breast cancer. So the pathologic stage is PTIS, and this is a stage zero breast cancer. In this particular talk, again, just want to review the evidence um, so that you understand the kind of the rationale for why we manage DCIS the way that we do. Uh, we'll start by talking about some trials that showed a local recurrence benefit to radiotherapy following lumpectomy for DCIS. We'll talk about trials investigating the role of omission of radiation in low-risk DCIS. Uh, and we'll briefly mention some genomic scoring techniques, the role of radiation following mastectomy, which, spoiler alert, there really isn't any role. Um, and then at the very end, we'll talk about considerations for radiotherapy for DCIS. If you listen to the overview lecture, I think I really tried to emphasize this. So after lumpectomy for DCIS, there's up to a 30% chance of DCIS recurring with lumpectomy alone. And 50% of the time when it does recur, the recurrence is actually invasive. And so there are a few seminal trials that show us that adjuvant radiation actually halves the risk of local recurrence. So I think I really tried to emphasize this in the overview lecture. I tried to emphasize it again just now. And so what are these trials? How do we, where do we get this evidence from? Let's get into it. Here is a table summarizing four major randomized clinical trials that investigated the role of whole breast irradiation following lumpectomy for DCIS. NSABP B17, Swede DCIS, EORTC10853, and the UK ANZ trial. So all of these patients took DCIS patients who underwent a lumpectomy and randomized them to plus or minus whole breast irradiation. And these are all older trials, so they were in the conventional area, era of radiation. So they all used 50 gray and 25 fractions. Important things to remember about the methods from these trials. So NSABP B17, um, allowed the physician to decide whether or not they would deliver a boost, and 90% of the patients ended up receiving a boost. The Swede DCIS and EORTC trials said no patients should receive a boost, um, but in the EORTC trial, 5% of the patients did end up getting one. In the UK ANZ trial, the design was actually a two-by-two two randomization design. 
So they were not only randomized to plus or minus uh, 50 gray of radiation, they were also randomized to receive either tamoxifen or no tamoxifen daily for five years. Um, so there was also a hormone question in the UKANZ trial. If you look at the latter half of the table, you can see where we get these numbers, right? It looks like for across all the trials, on average, the risk of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence following lumpectomy alone is somewhere in the neighborhood of 30%. And when we add whole breast irradiation, it reduces by around 15%. Um, so it approximately halves the rate of recurrence. If you look at that very last column, we see that around 50% of the recurrences that do happen are invasive, and indeed, whole breast irradiation reduces the risk of invasive recurrence as well. And so this is where we get that, that statement from, which I said in the previous slide, right? So we know that if we just do a lumpectomy for DCIS, there's up to 30% risk of recurrence. When it comes back, around half the time the recurrence is invasive, and so the rationale for adding whole breast irradiation is to half the rate of local recurrence, and it reduces not just the risk of any recurrence, but also the rate of invasive recurrence. Now importantly, none of these trials showed an overall survival benefit to whole breast irradiation. And this is the same thing that we saw in early stage breast cancer, right? Adding adjuvant radiation after lumpectomy only provides a local control benefit. It does not improve overall survival. And if we think about why that is, it makes a lot of sense. So if these patients undergo lumpectomy alone and then they end up having a recurrence because they didn't get radiation, we have a good salvage option for these patients and that salvage option is mastectomy. So those patients will still survive and they won't have a detriment to their overall survival because of the breast cancer However, they will have a severe impact on quality of life, right? We, don't, we want to spare the patients the mastectomy if possible. And so that's really the rationale for providing um, adjuvant radiation is to provide that local control benefit and to spare these patients from having to undergo a salvage mastectomy. There was an EPCTCG meta-analysis that actually... Um, did a meta-analysis of all four of these trials that we just mentioned. So NSABP B17, EORTC 10853, SWEET DCIS, and the UKANZ trials. And in the meta-analysis, we basically saw the same exact results. It corroborated everything that we just talked about. So remember, all four of these trials took patients with DCIS who had breast-conserving surgery, and they were randomized to receive either no further treatment or adjuvant whole breast irradiation. And if you look at the forest plot on the left-hand side, you see that the hazard ratio is just around 0.5, favoring the addition of radiation. So again, radiation around halves the risk of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence. If you take a look at the curve on the right-hand side, you see that any ipsilateral breast event was around 28% at 10 years with breast-conserving surgery alone, reduced to 13% at 10 years with the addition of radiation. So the big takeaway is that whole breast irradiation after DCIS plus lumpectomy halves the rate of both invasive and in situ recurrence. The EBCTCG also found that there was no significant difference in mortality with the 10-year breast cancer mortality rates somewhere between 1% to 5% for both groups. So again, adjuvant radiation provides a local control benefit but it has no effect on overall survival. So now that we know that adding radiation after lumpectomy for DCIS adds a local control benefit, one of the questions is, is there a low risk group of patients in which we can potentially omit radiation and, and get away with omitting radiation and just treat them with breast conserving surgery alone? Remember, we asked this question for early stage breast cancer as well with the PRIME2 and the CalGB trials, and there are other trials including uh, the Lumina study and the IDEA study that are going on looking at early stage invasive breast cancer. We asked this question for DCIS too. Is there a low risk group of patients? So we'll go through the trials and kind of understand what the results were. 
But the big takeaway is that even in low risk patients that have low grades, small tumors, clear margins that are at least two millimeters, it turns out that radiation still offers a significant local control benefit. And this is the same thing that we saw with the CalGB and the PRIME2 trials, right? So the recurrence was low, but there was still a significant benefit to adding radiation. And that benefit is important if patients are coming to us with really good performance status and they're you know, really healthy women. Um, and so let's take a look at some of these trials. ECOG 5194 was a single arm trial that ran in the late 90s, early 2000s. And it was a single arm trial of around 700 patients that were observed after undergoing lumpectomy for DCIS. In order to be enrolled on ECOG 5194, patients had to have either grade one to two DCIS measuring less than or equal to 2.5 centimeters or grade three DCIS that was less than or equal to one centimeter. These were kind of the criteria to be considered low risk enough to be enrolled in this single arm observation trial following lumpectomy for DCIS. So it's important to know what these criteria are, right? Grades one to two less than or equal to 2.5 centimeters or grade three less than or equal to one centimeter. These patients were treated with local excision alone and they actually needed a three millimeter clear margin. So at least three millimeters of clear margin. Remember, in the modern era, um, we, based on consensus guidelines, we agree that two millimeter margins are clear, are sufficient to be considered clear margins for DCIS. Um, but in this older trial, they actually wanted a larger three millimeter margin. 30% of the patients received tamoxifen. The results showed that when these patients that were quote unquote low risk DCIS were observed after lumpectomy, the risk of recurrence increased without plateau. So the 12 year rates of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence were 14% for grades one to two patients and 25% for grade three patients. The rates of invasive recurrence, remember invasive recurrence occurs around 50% of the time when the DCIS comes back. And so 8% for grades one to two and 13% for grade three. So if you're gonna remember one number, remember that the ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence at 12 years was 14% for grades one to two and 25% for grade three. So even in these patients with small tumors, um, less than or equal to 2.5 for grades one to two or less than or equal to one centimeter for grade three, they had a pretty high risk of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence. And that risk of recurrence continued to increase over the years without plateau. So the risk increases at around 1% per year for grades 1 to 2 disease and around 2% per year for grade 3. So this is a really big takeaway from this trial, right? ECOG 5194 was a single arm trial. Um, they took patients with DCIS that was quote unquote low risk and remember that that was defined as less than or equal to 2.5 centimeter grade one and two, or less than or equal to one centimeter grade three. They had to have three millimeter clear margins, but the risk of recurrence was still quite high. So around 14% for grades one to two and 25% for grade three. There was a 1% per year increase in risk for grades one to two and 2% 2 per year for grade three. So these are the results of ECOG 5194. The other study that we have looking at omission of radiation for low-risk DCIS is RTOG 9804, and this one was actually a randomized controlled trial with two treatment arms, but they took patients with what was defined as good-risk DCIS, and uh, this was um, kind of the first arm in ECOG 5194, or the first, the first uh, definition, which was grade 1 to 2, less than 2.5 centimeters. So they did not include any grade three patients as ECOG 5194 did. They only included grade one to two tumors that were less than, less than 2.5 centimeters in size. The patients were randomized to observation versus whole breast irradiation with conventional fractionation to 50 gray. 62% of the patients received tamoxifen, which was optional. And this trial actually closed early due to low accrual. But 
from the 600 patients that they ended up enrolling, what they found is that whole breast irradiation significantly improved local recurrence. So the rate of local recurrence was 7% without radiation down to 1% with radiation at a time point of around seven years. And they found no significant difference in the overall survival or disease-free survival with radiation. So again, adjuvant radiation in RTOG 9804 for patients in a low-risk cohort, grade 1 to 2, less than 2.5 centimeters, adjuvant radiation significantly improved local control down from 7% to 1% with the addition of radiation, and it was statistically significant. So again, these results are very, very similar to what we saw with the CALGB and PRIME2 results, right? In those trials for invasive early-stage breast cancer, we found that radiation reduced the risk of recurrence from around 10% down to 1% to 2%. So RTOG 9804, even in these low risk grade, 1 to 2, less than 2.5 centimeters, went from 7% down to 1%. I think that the big takeaway here is this is a risk-benefit discussion with your patient. So if a patient is, you know, let's say 70 years old, but in really great shape and really fit and no other major medical comorbidities, that significant improvement in local recurrence, even if she has a low risk DCIS, might be very important to her. And in that case, you know, you could offer adjuvant radiation. The other thing to keep in mind is that when RTOG 9804 was going on, the radiation regimen that we used was conventional fractionation. So 50 gray and 25 fractions over five weeks plus a possible boost of an additional week. So five to six weeks of radiation. Nowadays, we can, you know, there, we, we will present this in the next lecture, um, the different fractionation regimens that are available, but we only ever do, um, you know, moderately hypofractionated radiation, which typically takes three to four weeks if you're adding a boost. But a lot of these patients are candidates for partial breast irradiation or even just extremely accelerated uh, radiation, which takes place over five days. So just one week of radiation Monday through Friday. And so the, the risk benefit there is, you know, considerable, um, considerable benefits to doing the radiation at not a lot of cost and not a lot of toxicity. Um, so I think the, the key thing is to discuss this with your patient and come up with an informed decision together. Of course, if your patient has significant comorbidities, if the patient is, you know, very poor performance status, has a really hard time coming into the clinic, um, you know, omission is certainly reasonable and we know, you know, we can kind of quote these numbers from ECOG 5194 and 98, RTOG 9804. So major, major takeaways from everything that we've discussed so far in this talk. After a lumpectomy, the risk of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence is up to 30% um, after lumpectomy for DCIS. And about 50% of the time when it does come back, the recurrence is invasive. Adding radiation approximately halves the risk of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence, and it approximately halves the risk of invasive recurrence as well. And really the reason that we do it is to reduce that risk of invasive recurrence. Even in what are considered quote-unquote low-risk patients, we know that adjuvant radiation provides a significant local control benefit. So EOR, or ECOG 5194 showed that the risk of recurrence increased by around 1% to 2% per year, uh, depending on the grade, without plateau. And RTOG 9804 showed that local control benefit from 7% down to 1% with the addition of whole breast irradiation after a lumpectomy. So it's always a decision with your patients. And now with modern radiation techniques, you know, we can counsel them that it's not a lot of toxicity and it's a relatively short and convenient treatment. So a lot of patients will opt for the adjuvant radiation. I wanted to mention that there are some genomic assays uh, that, are, that have been validated as independent prognostic and predictive tools for estimating the risk of recurrence in DCIS. Um, so DCIS Oncotype is one of these, and it's based on molecular profiling of patients on the um, ECOG 5194 study and it was validated in a retrospective cohort. Um, the criticism of the DCS oncotype, I think, is that um, the risk of recurrence, even in just the low risk group, was high enough to warrant radiation. So using this particular genomic assay doesn't necessarily change our management. 
The Decision RT um, risk scoring um, assay, I think, has a little bit of better data. Um, this was generated based on seven protein biomarkers at the UCSF and also validated in retrospective cohorts, um, also validated in Swede DCIS. There was a PREDICT study um, published um, from folks at the Cleveland Clinic, and it showed that decision RT actually changed the decision of radiation approximately 42% of the time. So there was a 20% net decrease in radiation usage. 35% of the time, the decision changed from no radiation to adding radiation, and 46% of the time, it changed the other way. So utilization, I think, is very institution dependent, and it's sometimes case, dis case dependent. Um, it seems like some people always order this. Some people may order the decision RT if they're considering omission. I think it's good to know that these genomic risk scoring uh, assays exist. And um, kind of, I think there's a little bit of better data for decision RT versus decision oncotype. And then keep in mind that institutional practices may vary. Now, everything that we have discussed so far, all of the trials have been in the context of a lumpectomy for DCIS, so breast conserving surgery. What if patients elect to undergo a mastectomy? What is the role of adjuvant radiation? There really isn't much prospective data in this space, um, but typically based on retrospective studies, the recommendation is to just observe, even if patients have close or positive margins. There are two retrospective studies in this space, one from Harvard, one from UCSF. They both had, you know, 150 to 200 patient cohorts that were treated with mastectomy and without any post-op radiation. Um, and of these patients in the Harvard study, 15% had positive margins and 16% had close margins. And they only had two patients experience a chest wall recurrence, one patient that had a positive margin, one patient that had a close margin. The UCS F data, I think, is uh, similar. Four patients had positive margin and 55% of patients had a close margin. And the risk of recurrence was around 1.7% across the entire group, 3.4% for patients with high-grade disease. And so from there, we get the recommendation that following mastectomy for DCIS, observation is likely adequate even with close or positive margins. Now, one thing to remember is that if patients are undergoing a mastectomy for DCIS, the surgeon will typically perform a sentinel lymph node biopsy. The reason for this is if the pathology comes back and on final path you realize that there was an invasive component to the cancer, which can certainly happen sometimes, um, if you did a mastectomy, then there's no way of going back and mapping the sentinel lymph node. You would have to do an axillary lymph node dissection. And so just in case there's an invasive component, it's good practice to get a sentinel lymph node biopsy at the time of mastectomy for DCIS. If you're just doing a lumpectomy, that's not necessary um, because the integrity of the lymphatic anatomy is preserved. Um, it's really just if you're getting a mastectomy for DCIS. The very last thing I want to talk about is considerations for radiotherapy for DCIS. Um, in our next lecture on breast cancer, we're going to go through uh, the different trials that show evidence for moderate hypofractionation and extreme hypofractionation and even partial breast radiation. And one thing to keep in mind that when you're thinking about radiation for DCIS, we typically follow the same principles that we follow for invasive ductal carcinoma. So we consider either moderately or extremely hypofractionated whole breast radiation. Moderate fractionation is typically 15 to 16 fractions over three weeks and extremely hypofractionated is five fractions over one week. We do still consider boost, and again, same principles as invasive ductal carcinoma. If tumors are high grade, if patients are young, less than or equal to 50 years old, or if they have close or positive margins, that's when we think about boosting. And if patients meet guidelines, we can consider partial breast irradiation. So Astro recently updated their partial breast guidelines, and this was published in Practical Radiation Oncology last year. Um, so suitable patients for DCIS for APBI are patients with low to intermediate grade, age at least 40 years old, and size less than or equal to 2 centimeters. If patients have high-grade disease or tumor measuring 2 to 3 centimeters, it's considered cautionary. And patients that absolutely should not be getting APBI are patients that have positive margins, known BRCA1 to 2 mutation, or age less than 40 years old.
One thing that I think is important, the older guidelines from 2017 actually used to say that patients need to have less than or equal to three millimeter margin to, con to be considered suitable for uh, partial breast irradiation and DCIS. Um, I think they removed this, this mention of the margin. Um, and so I think I would just think about it as close or positive margins and be more cautionary in that case. And positive margins are definitely considered unsuitable for APBI. The other thing to remember is what is considered a close margin for DCIS. Remember, for DCIS, we want margins less than or equal to two millimeters in order to be considered clear. That is considered standard of care according to consensus guidelines from SSO, ASTRO, and ASCO. For invasive breast cancer, we say no tumor on ink is sufficient to be considered a negative margin, but for DCIS, we want margins that are clear of at least two millimeters. And that wraps up our talk on DCIS. Um, hopefully, if you guys have been following along and listening to the lectures on early stage, locally advanced, and DCIS, um, you have kind of remembered my disclaimers that, you know, we're not going through every single trial that exists. We're also not presenting every single trial in gory detail. You can, all these trials, you can dissect them journal club style and find out kind of all of the criticisms and flaws and, you know, little details of these trials. I'm really trying to present a big picture perspective and kind of the most salient details to take away. Um, I'm hoping that this approach is helpful um, because personally, I have a really hard time remembering these trials when we get into these nitty gritty details. Um, and I like to just kind of conceptualize the big picture before I, before I sort of dive in and, and get to know what's going on at the granular level. Um, so hopefully this approach has been really helpful. Um, and, and hopefully you've been able to take away some big picture ideas from our discussions on these trials. In our last talk, uh, for now at least, on breast cancer, um, I will be going through the different, um, you know, uh, fractionation regimens for breast cancer and kind of the evidence behind those. Um, so stay tuned. Thank you for your time and attention.